Thank you for joining us. I'm Peter Bergen, Vice President, Global Studies and Fellows at New America, and thrilled to have this extremely timely discussion with David Rode uh, about his incredibly timely book. Um, David is a uh, <clears throat> has published multiple books. Uh, for the purposes of this discussion, we're going to talk about where ty tyranny begins, the Justice Department, the FBI, and the war against democracy, which is really an account of the Department of Justice and FBI in, in Trump's first term, which has a lot of uh, important uh, relevance to his second term. And David also published before that, In Deep, the FBI, the CIA, and the Truth About America's Deep State, which he did when he was actually a fellow at New America and at ASU. Uh, David has won two Pulitzer Prizes. Um, he is, uh, uh, right now, he is the uh, Senior Executive Editor for National Security at NBC News. And before that, he was the Online News Director for The New Yorker, um, anyway, uh, thrilled to have you on, David, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to you to sort of give us uh, a little bit of a laydown of the, about the big themes and stories of, of your most recent book. Um, thank you so much for um, um, having me here. And, uh, you know, all your uh, private encouragement, um, Peter, as a friend for this latest book. And then, yes, my last book, um, In Deep, which was a look at the the, the question of, is there a deep state? I was a very lucky um, New America and ASU fellow, so I, I don't, I can't thank you enough personally, Peter, or New America for the support I've gotten to do both of these. And then I want to talk very much up to the minute about the current situation um, and how it reflects on the on the book. Um, my specific thing is a uh, an interview that my I'm now at NBC News, as you mentioned, and Kristen Welker, the host of Meet the Press, um, interviewed. President-elect Trump um, it was actually on Friday, but the full interview um, aired on Sunday. And he talked, he was asked specifically by um, Kristen Welker about, did he want his nominees for Attorney General Pam Bondi um, and Cash Patel for FBI Director to investigate the people who investigated him? And it was interesting. Um, Trump was, immediate response was, no, no, I will not direct them. Um, it's up to Pam Bondi and Cash Patel, who he said he had confidence in to decide who they want to investigate. Um, you know, a bit later, he shifted and said that he wanted to see everyone who was on the January 6th uh, panel in Congress uh, put in jail. Um, and this reflected a pattern I saw in the book. And so I want to switch back and forth, and I'm eager to take questions from Peter, but I want to talk first for about um, about the main findings of the book, um, where um, Trump was very care. He did the same thing in his first term. He did the same thing to uh, Jeff Sessions and Bill Barr, where he would say it was up to them um, in private. Um, I'm sorry, he would say it was up to them in public, but he would pressure them even in indirect ways um, in private. So I want, you know, it's it's very interesting and very important to look for patterns here. But, you know, Trump is very careful. People see him as reckless, I guess, given in the public statements he makes, but he's very careful about not um, directly saying or doing things that might implicate him. If you think back to the Mueller investigation and you think back about Corey Lewandowski, who was supposed to fire Mueller, um, you know, he was very careful in what he said to people um, there. So just if if folks are surprised by what he said this weekend, um, where he said it was up to his attorney general, um, and, and I've talked to several other people people who worked in his first term, you know, and their immediate responses was that this this isn't new. I mean, I have one official saying, you know, that he would he would express his opinion directly to senior Justice Department officials about who should be fired or prosecuted, but they didn't act on it. Um, you know, this one person said that, you know, the senior officials didn't treat his opinions as orders and that leaders of the Justice Department um, who take these positions know that they have to, um, once they're in these jobs, you know, they take an, an oath to uphold the Constitution. There's also norms inside the Justice Department, but it's their job to base prosecutions decisions on the facts and the law. And so right now, as president-elect, we're facing the same dynamic in terms of, you know, and many people will have questions about this. Um, you know, what will Trump do in his second term? How will he pressure folks? Uh, will there be, you know, widespread investigations? Um, another sort of piece of new um, relevant reporting 
um, and I'm I'm going to be vague here because I want to protect sources. Um, various individuals who I know, I'm going to go back and thank. <laughs> I think this over and over, but thank New America for the fellowship for In Deep, and and then Peter for his personal encouragement for the second book where tyranny begins. But um, people in the intelligence community, people in the FBI, and people in the DOJ have been reaching out um, on their own to get lawyers. They've been reaching out to associates to try to understand um, what's going to happen here. Uh, a lot of questions about Cash Patel. Um, and and I'll say it here, you know, I've, I've talked to some of them and they've, they've been asking me. Um, Cash Patel's book, um, Government Gangsters, uh, he talks explicitly about a deep state conspiracy. And, and um, he, there's an appendix to the book that lists the names of roughly 60 people that he identifies as, as members. He uses the word members of the executive branch deep state. Um, it's a fascinating list because it covers Republicans and Democrats. So Jim Comey, the former FBI director, is sort of an obvious name. James Clapper, the former director of national intelligence, um, who you know many conservatives are deeply suspicious of both of them, their names are there also. But what's fascinating is that according to Cash Patel's book and his his appendix B, um, Bill Barr, uh, Trump's attorney general, is also a part of the deep state. You know that could be a reference to Barr not wanting to um, back Trump's claims that the 2020 election was stolen. Um, and there's other Republicans, Pat Cipollone, uh, who was the White House counsel, who on January 6th, you know, did not push Trump's claims of a uh, voter election fraud in 2020, is on this list. So it's it's an extraordinary moment. Um, I'm I'm glad I wrote the books. I'm talking to many of these people who are very concerned about whether they'll be prosecuted. And the general feeling among them, I'm doing my reporting thing. Um, Peter's smiling now and then. I just want to give you the kind of the latest news here. Um, yeah. That this this talk, the the interview just from this weekend and, and then the nomination of Cash Patel in particular is having an impact. It is sending a message to the people who did investigate Trump in the past. They, again, they are hiring lawyers. They are asking around about, most importantly, what legal charge does Patel think he can bring um, against Jack Smith? Against- Well, actually, David, you know, this, is, this is, yeah, that, that's because I'm fascinated by this and I've learned from you that an FBI agent has to uh, I, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm going to get this wrong. But I mean, there has to be some predicate, some basis for an investigation. It can't just be like, well, I don't look like the way this guy, you know, the cut of his jib or whatever. So what because I'm I'm baffled by, let's say, the, let's say take the January 6th committee and take what and I and I read an account of this very good interview that NBC did with Trump this this over the weekend. And it, I thought it was kind of a little bit all over the map, not not the interview, but the, how Trump was responding, because, as you said, he first of all, he says, well, I, yeah, I won't pressure them. But then he says, I will go after the January 6th committee or something like that. So what could what, what could the grounds possibly be? That's the key question here. And that's, um, you know, one person, uh, a lawyer who's a big Trump supporter, uh, Mike Davis, he tweets a lot. Um and and he said that one of the one of the char I'm just going to shift to the concrete example I have, which is yeah. Jack. So Mike Davis, um, uh, who pe some people thought was in the running for attorney general, obviously didn't get it. Pam Bondi did. And we can talk more about Bondi, who does have a significant experience as a prosecutor. Um, but Mike Davis said that the, the one of the charges that was brought against Trump, a federal charge of denial of rights, where you're denying mm -hmm. A citizen rights. Now, Jack Smith said this, this was, he brought that in terms of the voters from the six, I think, or seven battleground states who, where Trump tried to reverse the outcome, Georgia, let's say, and, and, and Trump's efforts were denying them the right to have their vote accurately counted. Denial mm -hmm. of a federal right. These are, you know, many of these are post-Civil War statutes, i.e. denial of a right in terms of a, a Black American having the vote, you know, to write, I'm sorry, the right to vote um, during Reconstruction. And so Davis said that the same denial of rights charge could be applied to Jack Smith, that he somehow maybe denied Trump his rights 
I, mm. I don't understand. I mean, I'm, and I'm just, and I'm, it's very important to me. I want to say this explicitly. I'm going to say it earlier. Yeah. One of the positive things of this book was talking to many, many people close to Trump um, and and to understand their motivation, we can get into this later and and how they saw the Mueller investigation. You know, our job as journalists is absolutely to talk to both sides. So um, and but what's alarming is how differently the two sides um, see it. So I don't have any more specifics um, in terms of what charge would be brought, but there's still, you know, at least among Cash Patel and you know Mike Davis a belief and Trump himself that these are crimes somehow, a, a belief in a conspiracy. The one other thing I'll note, and you know, we can open it up, is that what we're going to see is I think the real bar here is uh, the John Durham investigation. And that was the special counsel appointed by Bill Barr to look at Crossfire Hurricane, to look at what the FBI did and, you know, Durham issued a report that, you know, it was a blistering criticism that the FBI never should have opened the Crossfire Hurricane investigation. And what I found in, in my work, my reporting for both books, was that many FBI and national security officials, the bottom line here is many of those FBI national security officials really feared, many journalists, I can say that firsthand, really that Trump was working with the Russians. And when I would speak to people who worked closely with Trump, I, I Jeff Sessions was nice enough to sit down and and I met him at his home in, in Alabama. And, you know, they people close to Trump found that laughable. They were like, there's no way he's coordinating with Russia. This is Trump derangement syndrome. Anyone who believes that. But I want to be fair to them that that on that side, you know, they have fears as well that the left and Democrats and, and sort of left-leaning prosecutors are going too far because of Trump uh, derangement syndrome. And then a specific answer, and I'll, I'll take a question. Um, Bill Barr is a lifelong believer that the Watergate reforms, the post-Nixon reforms that in some ways weaken the presidency, an independent Justice Department, special counsels that could investigate the president and his aides uh, for corruption, were all weakening the presidency. And Bill Barr gave a very long speech about this. Um, um, I'm sorry, I apologize. Um, and saying that he, when, when you looked at the history of the United States, when there was a crisis, when there was war, civil war, natural disasters, it was the executive branch, the presidency that would save the country. And that we are this, you know, very diverse nation, very divided nation. And so Barr has said he went into work as Trump's attorney general because he felt that the presidency was being weakened by the Mueller investigation, that it was completely unjustified, illegitimate investigation that didn't need to be carried out. That was simply an effort to weaken Trump politically. Um, and you see some of this, I would argue, in the Supreme Court's immunity decision which gives the president power to direct the attorney general absolute immunity for any conversations between the president and the attorney general. There's a lot of wording in that decision about the need to keep the presidency strong. I will stop talking, Peter. <laughs> well, so one thing here, David, is I think you know both supporters of President Trump and his defenders tend to conflate two very different things. One is the question, did the Russians interfere in the election uh, cam campaign of 2016? And 12 GRU military intelligence officers were indicted uh, for their interference, which was designed to damage Hillary Clinton and you know, help, help Trump maybe, but uh, you know, Putin's principal thing seemed to be that. And then there's a separate issue of, did the Trump campaign collude with Russia? And the answer is no. Yes. And, and where so if I'm a Trump defender, yeah, I feel pretty exercised about the fact there was no evidence of collusion, really. Um, there was. And, and in fact, as you know, David, and I think this says a lot about the FBI, which people on the left would have fastened on in the past, which is an FBI official forged uh, the, the warrantless surveillance application for Carter Page, who worked for the Trump campaign. Um, now, I, th I mean, there are a couple of things to be said about that. 
99.99, you know, Pfizer warrants are given they're willy nilly. There's no, there's no judge who sort of says, well, wait a minute. I mean, almost a hundred percent. And so the fact that this FBI agent forged something on Carter Page's uh, application suggests to me not simply that he was, you know, like some anti-Trump person, but that the FBI does this much more often than we think or know, because it all happens in a secret court. There is no judge. That, well, there is a judge, but there's no jury and there's no nobody standing in for the quote unquote, you know, the defendant. And some people have suggested we should have like some you know advocate in these courts. But anyway, the point is, is that clearly the left used to be very exercised about the FBI's warrant, you know, kind of intrusion into American privacy. And now it's the right. And, in, you know, in the Trump case, they're absolutely right. This thing we had with Carter Page was unacceptable. And I mean, I'm, you know, the history much better than I do. So is it is that basically a true um, portrayal of the facts? Absolutely. And this is the great <laughs> I'm sort of nerding out with you and, and everyone <laughs> is interested. But I this is the you're exactly right in that the point of the, the first book in deep and the second one is that the incredible power of the Justice Department, which oversees the FBI, but of the FBI in particular, to abuse Americans' rights. And the and and how in the past, yeah, the left was terrified of the FBI. And it was terrible things that J. Edgar Hoover did back um, to civil rights you know, leaders, to Martin Luther King, to anti-Vietnam War protesters. So the decision after Watergate was to make the FBI and DOJ more independent and apolitical. Um, because under Hoover, they they sort of fed dirt to every president. Hoover served four Democrats and four Republicans, and he sent dirt, you know, that made those presidents happy all the time. I think that that ended after Watergate. William Webster came in, the first um, FBI director to serve a 10-year term. That's relevant again today because here we have Chris Ray possibly being pushed out only seven years into his term. But it's this central question of what's the best way to control these powerful agencies. A last thing, and I, I don't want to be, uh, I, I'm trying to be as neutral as possible. Um, that lawyer forged that. He changed the the date. I can't, you may remember the, the details better than I do. It's a question of motive. And so um, was there a rush? I can tell you this as a reporter. I mean, I was working at Reuters at the time. We had the dossier throughout the 2016 election. Um, right. We didn't report a word of it, but did we chase it around? Did we think was ambition driving us? We were like, oh my gosh, the Republican nominee for president might be colluding with Russia, but we couldn't confirm it. And I'll, I, I couldn't report this at the time, but I, um, I, and I've now gotten permission to do it. I was working on a story and I, I'll stop in a second, but it's a pretty good anecdote. Mm -hmm. um, I was actually, this is the summer of 2016. Um, we, and look, we chased the stuff. I, um, you know, we, we were tr asking DOJ officials um, if it was true that um, it was questions about Carter Page and meeting with senior Russian officials in Moscow. And I asked a, a D DOJ official about that in July of 2016. They defied, they, they declined to confirm it. And then in, uh, I believe it was late September, early October, 2016, I was interviewing then CIA director, John Brennan, and I was in the CIA um, headquarters and interviewing him. And in front of several press people for the CIA, I asked John Brennan, do you know anything about, you know, incriminating tapes in Moscow, you know, the hotel room, the P tapes, as they were called. And, you know, Brennan sort of looked shocked. Um, and we were at that point, the conversation um, wasn't on the record. He said, I can talk about it now. But Brennan sort of said, whoa, whoa. you know, he's like, um, look, I'm not uh, I'm not conf I'm not saying anything about those what you're talking about. I, he sort of said, I don't know. He said, I I'm not saying that's true. I'm not saying that's true. But John Brennan, I swear to you, said to me again, weeks before the 2016 election, David, you're going to hear a lot of crazy things in the next few weeks about Donald Trump. Be careful. Be really careful. Make sure your information is accurate. And you're going to hear a lot of crazy things about Hillary Clinton in the next few weeks. Be very careful. Be, you know, only report what you can really nail down. And I swear that's what he told me. And our partisan divide is so deep that 
you know, that was my firsthand experience of this. Um, so I, the, the question is back to the lawyer, like, is his motive that he's rushing this, that he's, uh, uh, wants to break this big case, you know, lazy, or is he part of a deep state plot to discredit Trump's presidency? What I didn't find was overt, was any evidence of a coordinated plot to, you know, remove Trump from office. Um, there's a bias towards, you know, Journalists have it, you know, we, they want to be first, they want to win. There's a bias in the FBI towards the FBI to leak stories that help the FBI to defend the Bureau. Um, but I do think in the 50 years post Hoover, many, many agents and officials have told me they simply don't sit around. You never talk about politics inside the FBI. You don't sit around and say who you're going to vote for or this or that. If anything, Peter, you know this, you know, the 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 politics of the FBI leans right, leans Republican. So, yeah. you know, but anyway, you know, people, we should be afraid of the FBI. And I, I think the answer, though, is sort of more transparency. The FISA court, the surveillance court, I think there needs to be more transparency. I think there should be an advocate. Um, but so, so aren't so new be, in so American to, history. So to be clear, if somebody is... Um potentially going to be targeted by warrantless surveillance there should be an advocate on behalf of that person obviously you don't want to tip that person off that they're going to be surveyed because this is supposed to be a counterintelligence tool right yeah. so but you would want you know but if it's, if it's targeted an american citizen you would have wants at least want somebody to advocate on their behalf so these things are not just sort of granted a hundred percent of the time because surely a hundred percent of the time they can't always be correct and there are a lot of i mean i don't know that remember the numbers but there's a surprisingly large numbers of them that are granted yeah and look and there was you know unfair racial profiling um a religious profiling of muslims yeah. um, after 9 11 there's a long history again of racial profiling of black americans um and harassment you know of, of as i said black civil rights groups so you know we well, do well, need on the Sorry. Trump dossier, on the Steele dossier, yes. um, which I remember people talking about before Trump was, you know, during the campaign. Um, I never saw it, but I heard a lot about it. Because people were trying to stand it up. And of course, no one reported on it because they couldn't stand up elements of it. And then BuzzFeed kind of published the whole thing. But as far as I can tell, almost nothing in that dossier was true. I mean, there's the there's the well-known incidents that were that you've alluded to. But I mean, Almost all of it was bullshit. <laughs> yes, it turns out. I don't think there was really other than the, you know, very limited sort of facts. It, I mean, it was, but it, but it was treated as sort of this biblical document that uh, had a great authority because Steele had, you know, what were worked as a spy in the Soviet against the Russians, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and you're right. And the the vast majority, I think, all of it proved to be false. And then it comes back to what's your kind of view of Donald Trump? Like, could he, would he, um, you know, collude with the Russians or or would there be all this compromising information about him? Um, Trump did say in the famous press conference, you know, um, Russia find Hillary's emails, like call on them to find them. And then Russia did, in fact, break into the DNC and get embarrassing emails about Debbie Wasserman Schultz. We're sort of litigating past history here, but yeah, the, the fascinating and the alarming thing to me is that, you know, I think Cash Patel, potentially the new FBI director, um, sincerely believes that the 2020 election was stolen. He sincerely believes that there's more things to be found in terms of what, how Crossfire Hurricane was launched initially by the FBI. There's things to be found in terms of the January 6th investigation in Jack Smith's office, you know, the classified documents um, case, that there's real wrongdoing there. John Durham, you know, looked exhaustively for nearly four years, I believe, at Crossfire Hurricane. You know, that lawyer that we talked about pled guilty to falsifying that document. There were two, I believe, two jury trials were for people lying to the FBI. And, you know, those resulted in acquittals. So at least for John Durham, and he was blistering in his report. And I just, again, want to be fair. 
that he feels that the the investigation never should have been opened. Um, oh. But in terms of the Trump Russia crossfire hurricane investigation, but you know Durham did not find it seems criminal charges to file against you know Jim Comey and and Jim Clapper. Oh. But we are going we're going back towards the same. One, one of the strengths of your new book, David, I think, is also like you paint a very, you remind us like, of, of all the things that kind of created this cloud of suspicion around Trump that probably in the FBI, I I think I'm paraphrasing your book a little bit. I mean, there was obviously a debate about whether to do this or not, but you're sort of damned if, damned if you do, damned if you don't, right? Because, well, there was this you know, Trump encouraging the Russians to hack into clinton's emails and um you know there was so there would seem and you know of course he had the famous meeting in the white house where he said you know i fired jim comey because of the russia investigation he said it proudly to the russian ambassador <laughs> um yeah. so it just like you know he it it's it seemed like it was plausible um but of course that's that's not an argument in defense it just it's kind of the atmosphere of the time well, it's this atmosphere of hyperpartisanship. I mean, if you look at, you know, the Mueller report, you know, yeah. he found what you said, which was the Russians interfered and tried to help Hillary Clinton, but there was, you know, technically not enough legal evidence of coordination, you know, by the Trump campaign. Hey, and actually, but when I read the Mueller report, one of the things I struck was struck by was how in incompetent the Trump campaign was at the moment. You couldn't really collude yes. with them, even if you wanted to, because they were sort of all over the map at the time. Yes, and they, I think the term too is that they welcomed the help maybe, but they weren't, and 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 some on the left didn't accept the Mueller report. They were like, no, 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 there is, you know, coordination. So you have these deep suspicions on each side. And that's what worries me when you get to the present day, that it's, look, uh, we can talk about Merrick Garland and, and Jack Smith, but Pam Bondi, um, who has a lot of experience as a Florida attorney general, and she's made statements on, you know, Fox News saying the prosecutors will be prosecuted. And she added the bad ones because I think she was, you know, she will talk about her own experience. Cash Patel has been more of a firebrand about this, like saying we're, we're going to find this things. But but what I found in talking to FBI and DOJ officials who served in both, you know, the Trump first Trump administration, the Biden administration is that it's very hard. It's almost a mission impossible. You cannot solve, you cannot, sorry, please either partisan side. The facts don't fit either partisan narrative. And mm. that doesn't work very well on kind of, you know, opinion shows on cable TV. And and then more importantly, just in the terms of the current- Are you criticizing day, cable TV? No, I, I'm, <laughs> it's, I'm, my screen is blurred because it's on the TV behind me. But I um I'm not, and I I'm I'm very proud though to work at NBC News, and and we my unit we work with all of NBC News, but particularly. But, but I hear you; these things are not soundbite friendly. Well, they're not because you have to be afraid of the FBI. Why did that document get changed? You know, these are big questions. But is there nothing? Was there no reason to look into what was hap what the Russia what Russia was doing in the 2016 election? Like yeah. that's the nuance that we lose in our in our debate and just the last thing is and just right now back to like the interview on friday that kristen welker of nbc news did with trump there's fee there is real intimidation happening it's it's partly what trump says but it's it's also so the the where tyranny begins the 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 prologue of the book um is a meeting and it's this is uh, about a year and a half into the biden presidency and it's about um the search of Mar-a-Lago. And what's happening is, and the reason I started with that is because FBI agents and even some career DOJ officials don't want to get involved in politically sensitive investigations anymore. They're seen as lose-lose. They're seen as career enders. And so this was during the classified documents investigation. And there's a meeting um, in August, boy, I better get this right, of 20... 22, I think, um, that it's taken that long. There's been this year long effort to get the documents back, but it's, you know, the prologue is a, a come to Jesus meeting. And there had been, you know, weeks of fighting going on between DOJ prosecutors 
and some FBI officials who said, we have given Trump nearly a year to hand back these classified documents to the National Archives. We have got to go in and search his home. And then there was a group of uh, FBI officials led by the Washington, the head of the Washington field office, Stephen D'Antuano, saying, let's not search Mar-a-Lago yet. We're playing into Trump's narrative of jackbooted FBI agents searching the ex-president's home. And he, you know, there's a contentious meeting. The prologue describes it. And the meeting ends in deadlock. Like they, they, you know, and my point of citing all this is that our partisanship, you know, fear of political retribution has like seeped into our investigations and, and deadlock was delaying the search of the house. In the end, what happened was um, Trump had said he had his lawyer give over what he said for the last few dozen classified documents. And then they were able to get surveillance video that showed before he physically handed those over, this was all in May, um, that they that a bunch of people who worked at Mar-a-Lago were moving boxes of documents around and hiding them. So in the days before a DOJ official and an FBI official showed up to get what they thought were the last few documents, several dozen of them, in May 2021, they were hiding boxes after boxes. And once the DOJ and FBI got that surveillance video, um, Paula Bate, the deputy director of the FBI, ordered Stephen D'Antuano and his folks in the Washington field office to carry out the search of Mar-a-Lago. So, but there was a debate that went on for weeks. And I just, um, I said this, I've said this to you, Peter, but just broadly speaking, my worry is that for American democracy to function, we need nonpartisan government officials who are doing very basic tasks. Before the election, I said it was election clerks who are accurately and fairly counting the votes. Today, I'll say it's judges who are, you know, making fact-based rulings in terms of, you know, who won however many votes. Uh, should there be a surveillance warrant, you know, granted, uh, a secret one? And then we also need, I think, nonpartisan journalists who are presenting basic facts. And my fear is that fewer people are going to want to get involved in government service of any kind, or even just nonpartisan government service. And, and the kind of antidote to hyper-partisanship in my mind is, you know, more nonpartisan public service, um, not less. More, uh, you can laugh, more idealism here, more belief that there are basic facts we can agree on, because um, we just the constant point scoring is leading us down, a, I think, a dangerous path, a political point scoring. You have a question for David, please put it in the Slido application and I will. And also, if you want to buy the book, there's a button on screen to buy the book. So, David, let me um, I have a ton of questions. One is Pam Bondi. Um, you know, Matt Gates, uh, I, I remember I was on the I was on the train and I when I read that Matt Gates was the nominee, I, 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 I my my breath was taken away. The woman by me said, what's, what's wrong? <laughs> I was like, well, Matt Gates has been nominated to be attorney general. It seemed like, um, well, luckily we don't have that. So Pam Bondi, um, you know, you may disagree with her politically, but she seems like a serious human being. Is that, uh, and she would be, a, a, she has to, I mean, give, it, give us a sense of what she might be like as a, as an attorney general. Um, the, she has extensive experience compared to Matt Gates, who, um, and I'm not trying to disparage Matt Gates, but just in terms of legal opinion, Matt Gates had sort of briefly published law, but never prosecuted, sorry, practiced law, but never prosecuted um, a, a case um, in his life. So Pam Bondi was a local prosecutor, I think, um, at a county level for 16 years um, or a dozen years in Florida. Then she served two terms as attorney general there. And people who know her say that she does sort of respect the rule of law um, and, you know, that she won't violate, you know, the Constitution is what people have told me privately. Again, in this political moment, though, she there's all these clips of her on Fox News saying things like, and so this was that quote that I mentioned, you know, uh, the prosecutors will be prosecuted, the bad ones. And then she said the investigators will be investigated. That was after the Georgia case was filed against Trump in terms of the 2020 election. Mm. And again, in Republican circles, they they see it as lawfare, using law as warfare to weaken Trump and that those prosecutions were overkill by um, prosecutors in Georgia. And they, they say Jack Smith went so far. There's pretty much universal agreement that the strongest criminal case 
against Trump is the classified documents case, which we can talk about more. But um, so she now has a record, you know, because in our politics, you have to hit these notes of doing this. What, let me just, I can't remember if I said it earlier. Cash, sorry, Pam Bondi and Cash Patel, if they are confirmed, do not have easy tasks ahead of them because they are going to be, you know, expected by grassroots Trump supporters and possibly by Trump himself to find wrongdoing, to find right. criminal charges that can be bought, brought against these people. And again, I'm talking to people who could be the subjects of investigation. They're saying we did everything completely proper. Um, in terms of yeah. January 6th, Trip, Trip mentioned that the January 6th committee had um, destroyed documents. Um, Adam Schiff was on um, MSNBC this morning saying, I don't know what he's talking like. And I, I will see, but I don't think, as far as I know, it'd be very foolish for the January 6th committee to destroy documents. If they did, they should be investigated. But that's the challenge as we go into the second term is all the pressure to find the narrative that each partisan side wants. Yeah. How does the Joe Biden's pardon of Hunter Biden play into this? So I think... Um, and were you surprised um, or what was your reaction? I I was surprised by the wording that he put in um, the in terms of the, that that the, the 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 prosecution of Hunter was completely political. That was an argument that his lawyers made to the judges who heard both the tax case and the gun case, um, that no one had ever been prosecuted on these grounds. The judges said, no, that wasn't true. Um, again, a colleague of mine, Tom Winter at NBC News, interviewed um, the IRS agent who opened the initial investigation to Hunter Biden. And he was in a routine, uh, he became a whistleblower later for House Republicans, but he was looking at doing like routine bank transaction investigations and Hunter Biden's name appeared. And there was evidence that um, money from a company was being used to cover personal expenses, like improperly, like very large amounts of money and possibly for prostitution and illegal things. And this, you know, was an on-camera interview um, this person, this IRS agent said, I opened the investigation. It was me. I started it based on the evidence I heard from this routine specific thing I was doing. And then when he was asked by my colleague, Tom Winter about his politics, he said, I'm a Democrat, you know, and, but I brought this, this was based on the facts. So, um, so I thought, I mean, if maybe if, and it's not up to me to get into the politics stuff, if, if, if Biden had said like, you know, I don't trust the Trump administration and I think they'll bring him my son up on false charges. You know, maybe that would have been, I just worry that the statement that the president of the United States, president Biden saying the justice department run by Merrick Garland, the person that Biden appointed was politicized by, you know, doesn't build confidence. It plays into the same sort of deep state. Everybody's a political actor um, you what do you know, make of that I find exaggerated. What do you What do you make of these preemptive pardons? Because that seems like a slippery slope on multiple levels. I and you're getting my, my like you know, desperate like um, slash book author slash reporter trying not to be too uh, right. policy prescriptive, but I think that it it um, I think it plays into the same narrative this abuse of power that each side goes in. And, and look, there's always been corruption, law enforcement. Again, we've talked about horrific things that pass of, of racial profiling, religious profiling. But I, I think that again, and I could be naive, but the antidote to fears, uh, you know, to fears of of abuse, the awesome power of a prosecutor, the awesome power of the FBI, of police in every city and town, is that the answer is more transparency not less. The answer is lots of oversight, meaning I want to see the FISA court have much more of a, I want to see, sorry, the Senate and House intelligence committees being much more, or the House and Senate judiciary committees monitoring the FISA court more closely. I want three branches of government that are fighting each other all the time and leaking to the press <laughs> to get information out in public. We don't, you know, the two things I don't want to see are concentrations of power in one branch of government 
and I don't want to see secrecy. I want to, I want transparency. I think, you know, spreading out power between the branches of government and transparency are the best and and I'm sorry antidotes to abuse. I love um, learning new things. And I, one of the new things I learned from your book was the 1883 Pendleton Act. So tell us about <laughs> tell us about that because it's it seems a rather important thing. I didn't know anything about it, um, and I didn't really understand its genesis. Um, the the it's well the so the point is one of the other things Trump has talked about doing and it back to the deep state thing is that they're and the basic argument and 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 it's again it's there's one thing to say there are too many government workers okay Ronald Reagan too much bureaucracy too much waste and the the perpetual the state is always growing and you want to shrink it and that's fine and that's a legitimate argument maybe of a huge problem with the deficit but. This is very different. This is not that it's just waste. It's that these unelected government officials, um, this was in the op-ed uh, published in the Wall Street Journal by Elon Musk and Vivek Ramaswamy, that they are somehow taking over control of the government and how money is being spent from democratically elected presidents and, and members of Congress. And again, I find that to be exaggerated. The modern civil service was created when there was a huge amount of patronage and the Pendleton Act was a, um, oh boy, I'm going to get in trouble now, Peter. Um, late 1800s, huge amount of Tammany Hall patronage and then patronage in Washington that went um, as well. And a disgruntled supporter, and I cannot remember the name of the president. It was <laughs> Garfield. Garfield. James Garfield who expected to be getting a job as a diplomat in Europe because he'd supported Garfield politically, shot Garfield dead in Union yeah. Station, wounded him. He died several days later. The Pendleton Act was the creation of a modern public service where there were tests administered and that you have federal civil servants who pass these tests and have skills who work for Republican and Democratic administration. The Hatch Act, which was enacted after another corruption scandal around World War II or just before then, um, was barring those civil servants from engaging in any kind of political activity. On and, the job. Yes, on the job. And and it's very hard. But um, one little nugget again about the, the debate about whether to search Mar-a-Lago, the FBI agents who didn't want to do it looked up the political donations of one of the DOJ officials who was arguing for Mar-a-Lago to get searched. He had donated small amounts of money to Democrats years and years earlier but that made them suspicious. So maybe the this this post Watergate period of eight presidents, roughly fifty years, William Webster leading the FBI, saying you know um, defend the American people and defend the Constitution at the same time. That was his ethos to the FBI. Maybe this five decades was like some halcyon period, but people were able. There was a belief that a civil servant, a prosecutor. A police officer even could put aside their personal politics and investigate a case and a crime in a neutral way. And we've kind of lost that. And I again, I worry where that's leading us in terms of and then, Peter, I'll say what you and I both know. We, you've mentioned Afghanistan and, you know, we both cover the war in Afghanistan. I cover the war in Bosnia. I I, I worry and this is maybe a problem in my personal bias that these conspiracy theories I saw conspiracy theories help spark violence and eventually, you know, wars, civil wars in these countries. We are nowhere near civil war here. I'm not suggesting that, but I worry about the power of conspiracy theories to get at least lone wolves to go out and and use violence because they think they're, you know, defending democracy. And and there's so much false information and conspiracy theories online today that I, I worry about violence. In your book, Bill Barr is the attorney general and for much of Trump's first term is a sort of Shakespearean character. Much of the time he's playing the villain and at the end he plays the hero. So why the villain and why the hero? Well, again, I, I try to be really far to, fair to Barr. And I, I say this in the book, like he really didn't talk to me. Um, he was, I was, I previously worked as a New Yorker, as you mentioned, I read, wrote a profile about him that he did not like. And he felt was unfair. I, I talked to him once and and he, you know, he has a right to his opinion. And he said I was too, you know, he felt I was too left leaning. But I did ask him for throughout over nearly three years working on the book. I kept begging to meet with him. 
but I, and I read, you know, a lot of interviews and other things he'd done. So I, I believe he came into the Trump administration to defend the presidency, as I talked about earlier, that it was being, it would be, it was being weakened. I mean, he felt that the, you know, the War Powers Act, getting into foreign affairs, Peter, was another post-Watergate weakening of the presidency and that you need a strong president. But he had his limits. Um, and that limit was the 2020 election. Um, you know, he there wasn't evidence. You know, he agreed that it was stolen from Trump and he told Trump to his face. He told the public that in a famous- he, he wouldn't, he, Sorry, David, he, just to clarify. He yes. agreed that it was not stolen from Trump. It was not stolen. There was not. He agreed that there was no no evidence of widespread fraud that would have changed the outcome of the 2020 election. Bill Barr agreed that Donald Trump lost the 2020 election, and and he he did that, and he was very public about it, um, and and I give him credit for that. Uh, be, and 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 one and then there's the other anecdote of after Trump leaves. Um, excuse me, after Barr leaves, Barr resigns, um, Trump tries to put in Jeffrey Clark, who's a sort of mid-level DOJ official who believes that there was voter fraud on a massive scale and who's going to launch a federal DOJ investigation of voter fraud in Georgia. And when Trump tries to make um, Jeff Clark, you know, the acting attorney general on, it's January 3rd, three days before January 6th, 10 at least or a dozen senior DOJ officials, including Jeff Rosen, the acting attorney general at that time, threatened to resign. These are all conservatives who very much support, you know, they worked for Trump, they worked in the Trump, you know, DOJ. There is a, a loyalty, I think, that Bill Barr feels and Jeff Rosen and these other nine or 10 people to the DOJ and public trust in the DOJ. And they all threatened to resign and it stopped Trump. He blacked off and he didn't make Jeff Clark the, the acting attorney general because 10 conservatives, you know, Republicans all threatened to resign. It was very much like the Saturday Night Massacre during Watergate. Yeah. They all chose to not go public, um, but they were worried that that letting Jeffrey Clark become attorney general would destroy public trust in the Justice Department. And that would hurt the country and the Justice Department in terms of criminal investigations, people giving information to law enforcement, and they did the right thing. I saw one of those people recently, and I was like, do you regret not being more public about it? You could have been the Archibald Cox of you know the current era. Mm -hmm. And the person said no, because they're eager to go back in government and continue to do proper nonpartisan sort of work. And it was really amazing. Like I, You know more folks in DC than I do, Peter, but there's this desire People, once they're in their government, they tend to really like it. There's a special feeling of, of of public service that many people enjoy. And again, maybe I'm naive, but I I want to see more of that. So we talked a bit about Pam Bondi. The other point, um, Trump has also nominated people below her in the kind of uh, pecking order at, at Justice. Who who else have he appointed, and what what's their story? So there's a concern that the deputy attorney general, the number two official, is, is Todd Blanche. Um, he uh, has been, and until he takes office, is you know, serving as Trump's lead defense lawyer. Um, again, Todd Blanche, though, worked for a decade as a prosecutor in Manhattan, in the technically the Southern District of New York. It's known as you know the Sovereign District of New York. It's this, the most powerful U.S. attorney's office um, in the country. And then another uh, defense lawyer for Trump, Emil Bove, also worked for the Justice Department. And, you know, we've been talking to people there, people in the system, the sort of career people are not worried about Todd Blanche and Emil Bove. They trust them to abide by the norms of the Justice Department and that they won't do anything illegal, that they'll resign because they want to have futures in law and all these other things. And there's a mixed picture with Pam Bonney. There's a lot less worry about her than about Matt Gates who would seen as he would do anything. Um, but the most concerning nominee by far of the people I've talked to is Cash Patel. And we can talk about him more if you want, but. Yeah, um, so let's do so. What, I mean, what um, what is it specifically about Cash Patel that has people worried? Because on some levels, he has ticked quite a few boxes in the uh, upper reaches of the Trump administration. He was senior director for counterterrorism. I think he was acting chief of staff for the, 
director of national intelligence and then also at the Pentagon. And, you know, and he, uh, so it's not like he has no executive experience, executive branch experience. So what is it about him? And he also doesn't have all the personal baggage that Matt Gates and some other nominees have. Uh, so what, 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 why the worry about him? I, it's, it's the, um, you have a split where you have certain people, Pam Bondi after she actually went to Philadelphia in the, right after the days, uh, and after the 2020 election and was in Pennsylvania saying it had been stolen. And then she sort of backed off that. So in terms of kind of all the people that worked in the first Trump administration, and again, you had Pat Cipollone, you had Mike, Mike Pence risk his life and, and stay in the Capitol when the mob was, you know, coming for him. And so Cash Patel has stayed on these unproven claims that the 2020 election was stolen. There's a very, you know, small circle that still talks about that publicly and says that that happened. And, you know, I've read parts of his book, but not his whole book. But he, so he, he doesn't have as much experience in terms of actually running these federal agencies. He has some, as you talked about, but he was essentially a public defender in Florida as a lawyer first for about 10 years. And he writes about like prosecutors withholding evidence. And it's, and again, maybe I'm naive, but, but it's, um, it's anyway, he, he does that for 10 years. Then he works in the national security division, the part of the justice department that we both know well, that looks at counterintelligence and, and, but he really comes into his own when he's pushing when Trump wins, he's actually working under the in the Obama Justice Department for its last several years. Um, but there's there's evidence I found that he exaggerated his role. He said he was the lead prosecutor in the Benghazi case, the one individual they were able to bring back to the United States. There's no record of that. DOJ officials, that's not true. After he leaves the DOJ, he starts working for Devin Nunes. He publishes this memo that correctly does lead to the 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 revealing of the improper Carter Page um, surveillance. And he's right about that. But what it's not is, you know, what he writes in Appendix B, 60 people that are part of a deep state conspiracy that spans from Jim Comey to Hillary Clinton to Bill Barr to Pat Cipollone. Like it's, it's this idea that, I mean, again, bureaucrats waste money or are lazy or you know, or or literally that the FBI that the FBI was wrong to launch Crossfire Hurricane, and and I guess it's something we'll never agree on. But it's kind of like, you know, I you know, does there should there have been an investigation of whether of the Russians for sure? I think every American would agree with that, you know. But should there be investigations of Donald Trump, you know, in terms of coordination with Russia, in terms of his actions on January sixth, and in terms of his failure to return classified documents? The strongest case, I would say, was the classified documents case. But, you know, you're, I just would argue that those three cases aren't evidence of a deep state plot and, at, you know, that justifies giving massive new powers to the president. Um, and I'm sorry, back to the Pendleton Act. One of the things, Project 25, and that Donald Trump is talking about doing. It's something called Schedule F, and it's this executive order to try to shift the number of appointees, the president's names. So now it's only 4,000. There's several million people who work for the federal government. Only 4,000 are now, and the senior officials appointed by the president. It would reverse the Pendleton Act. It would, it would, it would change our system. So now the president would personally appoint tens of thousands of federal workers. Now, if you support that, that's a great way to have democracy and the president's elected and the president has a democratic mandate. If you're afraid of the president weaponizing the government, engaging in patronage, bringing in incompetent loyalists, you don't like that idea. But these are seismic changes to the divisions of well, power. And also, I mean, there'd be no incentive, very, the incentives to actually join, to become a civil servant, let's say to learn Chinese and to go off to or a hard language like Russian or Arabic and become a State Department official or specialize in arms control negotiations. I mean, the, the incentives to develop these skills or go up the career ladder would disappear because it, you know, it, because also, also it's very short-sighted because 
there will be a democratic president <laughs> at some point in 2028 or you know whenever it is he or she then presumably would have fire all these people yes. and we get into these tit for tat firings where basically the whole you know it's like it's like when the united states got rid of everybody in the bath party at the top and iraq collapsed because it, anybody with any experience of government was out of a job so you know it just seems very short-sighted uh apart from all the other issues and i, I think it's going to encounter tons of legal problems because they're federal unions and people yes. are getting I mean, but then i guess the last question for you david is so given the fact there are impediments you can't just fire people with a nilly and the civil service protections etc what you probably m might seem likely is to uh, pour encourager les autres you kind of fire you know a, a, you, you you basically guillotine a few people at the top <laughs> or try to and that sort of brings everybody else into line is that what yeah. you anticipate that's what i anticipate andy mccabe the deputy fbi director having his pension revoked as i worked mm -hmm. on books and especially where tyranny begins that really was a shot across the bow to civil servants who don't make much money so the key thing to watch in the next four years is does the power of the presidency rapidly expand does trump get to a point tens of thousands of people Musk and Ramaswamy are talking about giving the president more power to direct funds that have been appropriated by Congress. And they said in their op-ed that they think this Supreme Court, which just gave the president absolute immunity to direct the Justice Department, this has never existed before in American history to you know, do anything he wants, including investigate people. They think that this Supreme Court will agree that the president can redirect funds appropriated by Congress. So these are historic seismic tectonic changes in the balance of power. Three co-equal branches has been our approach. Some argue it's not working, it's all deadlocked, but it's momentous what's happening. Um, so I don't know what's gonna happen in the next four years. Uh, I hope there's nonpartisan public service who keep, one, one of the people, uh, FBI person, I was just trying to call balls and strikes. And I, I admire that, and I, I, I hope we can get uh, more of that. And I, um, you know, I'm, but it's hard for me to know exactly what's going to happen. Well, Dave, thank, congratulations on your tiny new book, Where Tyranny Begins. And um, um, and I know it's a busy news day for you, so thank you for taking time <laughs> to do this. Well, I'm thrilled for all your support over the years, and I hope this topic and these books interest people. Yeah, thank you very much, Dave. Okay.